Jeffy, you do the introduction. Do an introduction? Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. Welcome to iHack. I have a question number five being streamed live on EdTech Talk. It is May 4th in part of the world and May 5th here in Pusan, South Korea, where I would like to wish everyone a very happy Children's Day. Uh, which is an official holiday, no work, I don't have to go to work after this, and a very happy Cinco de Mayo. I do have to go to a Cinco de Mayo party after this, hence my uh, facial hair. Often you can tell I sort of sculpted it with mustache-centric um, engineering. In any event, uh, join Poor by... Guy. Dave <laughs> that's that's going to be the last time he does that's the awful. intro, by the way. I'm fired. I'm fired already. <laughs> You're fired. Sorry. I'm sorry. I walked all over. <laughs> Dave, who are you again, Dave? Go ahead. Okay, okay. take two. This is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. <laughs> Dave Cormier, Shelltown, Prince Edward Island. <laughs> John Jennifer Tinker, Mag Ohio. <laughs> Jennifer Mandel in Chicago, and I forgot why we're here, frankly. <laughs> it's because it's because somebody has a question, Jen. People oh, have questions. You have answers. Okay. That's why we're here. Right. And this week's question comes from Benjamin New York. Uh, and his question is, why does Sugata Mitra make so many people in education angry? Uh, and why is that? Well, I think maybe the the simple answer is because he tells them that they don't need to work and they want to work, and that everything they're currently doing is unnecessary and probably in, ineffective. <laughs> or family. maybe that if education is about pushing content to students and the students already have the content, then what are we wasting our time on? And by way of background, we should mention Sugata Mitra. You may have seen him on TED. He's had a few TED Talks already. He did the Hole in the Wall project where he tosses a computer into a wall in some very poor area in the developing world and does no instruction, and kids learn. They learn English. They learn programming. They learn lots of digital skills. Um, and he gave a presentation, a keynote speech, at an IATEFL conference a month ago and was making the point that... Um, well, making kind of the same points he always did, but along the way mentioned that, you know, if a computer can do the job that a teacher is doing, it should. And teachers, just like we're going to have fewer postmen than we used to and fewer uh, handheld rickshaw drivers, there may be fewer teachers doing the kinds of things teachers are doing now. Not that educators don't have a role, but I, anyway, half the audience gave him a standing ovation and half the audience walked out. There's been lots of discussion in the blogosphere and now there's going to be discussion here. Yeah. And then, uh, Jeff, your links, um, you didn't have Audrey's in there. I just put it in there, but I just noticed she wrote hers back uh, March of 2013. So <laughs> even though, as you're saying, this was a, a recent talk, he's been, and I listened to two of his um, talks. They're about 20 minutes long. Well, one obviously is 18, one TED Talk, but he had another one, and they were almost identical. So I think he's been doing this same little spiel for <laughs> a good, almost a decade at this point. Um, so if you haven't heard one of them, you don't need to listen to them all. You just need to listen to one, and it's pretty much <laughs> the same. But there are aspects of it that are very intriguing, and really uh, a lot of the themes that we talk about here, the whole, as, as um, John was saying, that this whole idea that education shouldn't just be, uh, as some of my students call it, a pig trough pedagogy, where you just have them belly up to the bar and you throw a bunch of information at them. So it says a lot of things that make sense. It's, I think, when, when anybody takes their idea to the extreme and saying we should abandon everything we've ever done and, and this is the only way to do it, that's when I think people will walk out of the room. Half the room will walk out. And that was my take, because I think there were part aspects of what he was saying that were intriguing. Did anyone feel angry from what they've seen or, or really, like, bothered by anything he said? But who ha I mean, how many de – we've heard so much about this. The computers are re revolutionizing education, and uh, let's all stand back and just let the computer take – I mean, he's not really saying – he's not the only one saying these types of things, so – no, and I think he's saying them in kind of a wow kind of way in order to, you know, get his speaking fees whenever he's wandering around the world speaking live to people. So, I mean, um, you know, he's a salesman and he goes around, he's got, you know, this thing that he sells. And, and I don't understand what he, you'd only get mad about it if you thought he was somebody who we should pay attention to when we talk about learning um, and, and somehow in control of that discourse. Unfortunately, uh, in some countries south of us, um, some people who are famous tend to be inside the education discussion maybe a little more than they should be, where some people who are, I don't know what the word would be, experienced, uh, knowledgeable, um, aren't so much involved in that discussion. So I think that for some people, 
the fact that there's another person saying that saying the things he's saying about teaching, I can see how that would irritate them. Oh, I'm very pleased to welcome Graham Stanley to the conversation. Uh, Graham wrote uh, two pieces related to uh, Sugata Mitra's recent speech. Uh, the first being kind of a, oh, I think he's going to, I haven't watched his speech, but the points make sense. And the second one being, oh, now I kind of get why people are angry. Graham, firstly, <laughs> welcome. Hi. Hi there. And w the question on the floor is, well, as you've engaged with uh, Mitra's content, did anything make you angry? Has anything made you angry? Um, well, as I wrote in my blog post, I think um, my first reaction was uh, when the um, when people started posting on Facebook and on Twitter about the uh, the plenary was, was one of dismay. I didn't realize. I, I kind of couldn't believe. That people got uh, got so upset, the teachers got upset, so upset about it. Um, so I started defending uh, Sugatra, Sugatra Mitra, um, and then I then I went and uh, listened to the uh, plenary very carefully, and I kind of understood then why people got angry because uh, he wasn't very clear during the plenary. Um, it wasn't very clear that. Uh, the idea of a soul, when there is a teacher available, that it promotes the use of a teacher. So during the plenary, if you just watch that, if that's all you know about souls, and the interview that follows, you get the idea that um, that he's proposing replacing teachers with these grannies, which isn't the case, and that was rectified uh, later. But for about a week, it was very confusing. A lot of people really didn't sort of understand uh, that that was the case and they thought he was um, he was uh, promoting getting rid of teachers and replacing them with um, cheaper alternatives which is why a lot of teachers got very angry that's that's the main thing I think that was rectified but then um, there's still other reasons why some people are still unhappy and just to clarify what the granny in the cloud thing is, he one of his points is that you give a, a kid a computer and they can go from like 0 to 30% in terms of assessment at a, like a, a university level on some advanced topics or whatever. But to get them to the next step of let's say a 50%, that it helps to have a someone play the granny role, someone who is paying attention to their learning and offers encouragement. And that's pretty much as he defined the role. And so he's had these virtual grannies uh, from England Skyping in to these developing world where kids are engaging with the computers. Um, yeah, so what let, else? Let, should, should we, let, let's break, so, let, let's break down some of the things. Like the soul is the what self-organized learning environment, right? And so I, in a, you, you know, I, I learned it in for 20 minutes today in two chunks, <laughs> almost identical chunks of uh, material. So please, you can uh, correct me if I, I don't have it completely uh, conceptualized. But I, the way I understood it is that there's a, kind of a, a mega question prompt that the students then run with. Um, and then they are to, as, as the acronym would imply, self-organize. So either work alone or work with someone else and just head out into the interwebs and try to tackle that problem. And this whole idea of this guide on the side is really only there, not really, it is primarily there as a means of encouragement to make sure the student is moving forward, not necessarily there to guide that discovery. Is that a fair summary of what he's talking about in these environments? It is say, to me. So, <laughs> so a manager of learning as opposed to a teacher. Yes, I think um, there seems to be two variations on the soul, though, isn't there? There's one where, where the teacher isn't available, then the soul is exactly as, as Jennifer said. It's um, a kind of environment. It could be a classroom with clusters of computers where kids are provided uh, a kind of stimulus in the form of a question for learning where they go away and they learn on them by themselves with minimal intervention. Um, and the idea of the uh, granny in the cloud is is 
is to get someone into the room um, when the teacher's not available. So that I think is is probably admirable, uh, an admirable solution, or at least an attempt at a solution to provide um, some kind of education uh, where no trained teachers are available. It's an extension of his hole in the wall project. So that's one version of it. Uh, the second version seems to be uh, what he's experimenting with, for example, in um, the northeast of England, where incidentally I come from, uh, just outside of Newcastle, in places like Washington and Killingworth, where he's basically set up souls in schools where there are teachers. And it seems to me, from what I can gather from what he said and what there is out there on YouTube and and on the blogosphere, etc., that uh, there it's basically an alternative for teachers to take um, students into the this soul rather than work with them in the classroom. Um, but there it doesn't seem to be something they do very often. So it's uh, an occasional thing that they're doing in schools, from what I can see. And it's always followed up by discussion, etc. So in that case, the soul is really um, a kind of a version of a teacher standing back and allowing kind of discovery learning to take place um, with minimal intervention. I'm just not used to Dave being quiet. I, I was long. just about to say, <laughs> Dave, sorry, throat today. Yeah, it's been it's been like five minutes since he's talked. Let's just pause oh, and let him jump oh in. <laughs> uh, I think that. Um, to that extent, when we talk about something replacing nothing, I think that the stuff that, that he's talking about is good, and I think there's a lot of other models of that out there right now in places where people have places to go um, to help um, push them to the next level. The question comes down, and, and there are two kinds of things going on here. I agree with the overreaction stuff that you said, Graham. Certainly in my looking around, it seems that you know it's not saying anything profoundly out there compared to the Ken Robinsons or the rest of those people, right? But the question becomes, for me, and for like the, the article we started on when we started talking about neoliberal ideology here the other day, um, which is great for the ed tech talk, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> but the question is, is what is knowledge in this case? And what is knowledge for Sugata Mitra? And how does he count success? So when he looks at things people have learned and the fact that they can test out on whatever test from something, 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 there be, there, that focus back to the test and back to knowledge as commodity becomes the issue for me. When I look at the teaching environment, when I look at a good classroom, when I talk to a teacher who gives me that, oh my God, this is a good teacher feeling, um, that person is looking at a holistic student. They're looking at the way they feel, the way they interact with other kids, the way that they become naturalized to our society based on being involved in this cultural thing that we have called school. Um, that's not something he is talking about at all. So there's something about what he does that feeds into this agenda to talk about, like into the Khan Academy agenda where we talk about the commodification of knowledge where we have this thing and if you pass the test then hooray we've won. Um, and, and that's the part of his work that concerns me um, and not so much in that, it's not that you couldn't take the stuff he's doing and make that happen, it's that he seems totally uninterested in it. And when we talk about a vision for the future of education, the idea of a future of education that isn't inherently social, the idea of discovery learning that's not social, those are the things that confer the idea of somebody going away by themselves and like discovering their way there, but I don't think that's what he's saying. I, I feel like the social and affective are a he, part of what he's not, saying. He's not saying it, though. But he, he's talking about people. He makes the point of students gathering around. That you, In fact, in, in the UK, they had one computer per kid. And they said, no, no, no. You need one computer for every four or five because the social learning is part of what makes this happen. But is it social? Yeah. Is it learning to get, like... Do, like, are they learning the content, or are they learning the social, and how is that being they're, managed? They're learning like, what they want. I mean, I think, I don't know how much she Have you read it. Lord of the Flies? <laughs> <laughs> People made that point. No, um, but he's... Yep. Go ahead. Graham was going to jump in, I thought. Um, no, I was just going to say part two of, of what I started saying about the 
the reaction of teachers at the IETEFL conference, and, and I've done a lot of reading of the blogs of the people who were there, for example, over the last few weeks, um, was, was that there is indeed that suspicion, I think, Dave, and, and that sort of uh, judgment being made uh, to his ideas. I think apart from, you know, his clarification of how souls were operating when there isn't a teacher available and when there, there is a teacher available is one thing. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, when there, there's two things that come up, I think, for me. One of them is when there isn't a teacher there, um, there are some people who are still unhappy with the idea of providing a kind of soul uh, because they think the, the argument that you use it's better than nothing, and there's there's a there's an argument that well better than nothing isn't really good enough. In other words, if you if you're putting in computers into uh, classrooms without teachers because it's better than nothing and it's it's cheaper than getting a teacher or um, easier than getting a teacher there, you might get to the situation where some um, governments or education authorities may well believe, well, that's good enough. Um, and I think the there wouldn't really be a problem with that if this was a short-term solution where the idea was, okay, we'll do this now, but the um, long-term solution and the ideal situation is actually having a teacher in, the, in those schools. And I think there's a kind of suspicion that that there's a kind of experiment going on at the moment to see whether that is the case. And so there are, there's a kind of feeling from some teachers that this is an experiment that if it could um, may lead to some data being um, uh, sort of uh, presented in the future, which could then lead to education authorities in various parts of the world using that as an excuse to cut teachers by half, which I think anyone involved in education uh, would think is probably a dangerous idea. I, think, I don't know. You know especially know. as learning like... being... I don't know if that is a dangerous idea. I think there are a lot of situations where the number of teachers could be cut in half and and bad things would not happen. I mean, I think there's no reason for a lecturer at a university to stand up in front of 500 people and read his notes and give the same lecture he gave last semester. And to pay that guy so much and to jack up the cost of university because of that. Um, I Jeff, think, oh, I think, um, can I just interrupt and say, I think you're right with in universities. I think probably this is where things could really change. Uh, universities, you're talking about adults who are presumably quite intelligent and uh, should be at some point quite autonomous. Um, oh, no. You can interrupt for in a minute. But when it comes to schools, <laughs> primary school children, secondary school children, then I think things are different. We wouldn't. I wouldn't like to see the teacher removed uh, from there. I work now in Uruguay where schools are only open half of the day so the schools are uh, the children only the primary school children only go to school either four hours in the morning or four hours in the afternoon and then when they get to secondary school the, there's a kind of um, there's a feeling of why is there so much sort of um, failure at secondary school level and I'm convinced and I think many people are convinced that it's probably due to the fact that the schools aren't open uh, enough hours at primary level. So I think when you when you say perhaps education could be changed um, and half the teachers could be removed, I think that may well be the case at university level. We can talk about that if you like. But I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't like to see that happen at primary level or secondary school level. I'd it's like to make... Happening, though. Can I, can I, I mean, make two it's, points? It's happening oh. in the charter school movements. Go ahead, Dave. We can't really hear you, John. What were you saying? Okay. Uh, I was saying that uh, this is what we're seeing in the charter school movement, the online charters, in that uh, they're putting 
students into online environments where they're interacting with content almost all of the time. The teacher really get into a role where they're managing student instruction. So just making sure that kids are on track to finish the course on time and doing that's of that. And so the, the teacher handle hundreds and hundreds of kids at a time because they're not really doing anything but making sure that the kids are doing their work. Right. Um, just, just a quick point that goes back to what Jeff said before we get to that one. Um, if we stop teaching, stop charging kids for 500 person in a class classes in university, 50% of the universities around the world would close tomorrow because that is the financial model that underwrites the survival of higher education. So, Currently. I mean, well, well, we would have to find another means of, of either paying for it or people would have to pay twice as much because um, that underwrites higher ed, the, the, the number distinction there at the earlier classes in the big universities. So that's the first point. The second one goes to what John is saying and to what Graham is saying. I spent last week in Texas at something called... Um, the design jam for learning analytics for a course that's going to be taught on learning analytics in October. And the guy sitting next to me, who's at Berkeley, looks at me and goes, yeah, it's all about Bayesian knowledge tracing. And I went, I, 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 what? And he goes, yeah, Bayesian knowledge tracing. Um, and what it is, is tracking, yeah, that thing, tracking the path that people took through computers to learn things and then adapting the way that we build things to get them through faster or get them to the end of the question better so that they have a better chance of succeeding. This kind of research underwrites a lot of, I'm not talking about Sugar, I mean, sure, frankly, I don't know where his, his high-end like financial connections are. But for what a lot of people on the back end are talking about now is the advantage of this move is the fact that we get to watch all the clicks. And what that does is it forces us to take learning more and more towards it being an object, a commodity, so it can be measured. And there are ways you can measure text and all this crazy stuff, but basically it becomes more and more formulaic so you can measure it better and better so you can fine-tune it more and more. And my concern about that is that that's just, that's not how I see learning. Um, so the other part of this, this shift to computer stuff is the whole data analytics agenda that runs our supermarkets and there's a lot of people who would like to have it run our schools as well. Yeah, he definitely talked about that in one of his um, talks, is, especially when he taught, what's the thing in the cloud, um, school in the cloud, I guess, right, mm -hmm. is that what he called? And that's his whole idea. Is just, he, he, he had an appeal in one of the talks that I listened to is, if you're doing this, please allow me access to your data for the exact points you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and Kathy's making some really good points, and I, I'm trying to scroll back through in the chat room um, to try to grab them, but uh, it, it's kind of some of these things, themes come up all the time when we talk about discovery learning or anything like that is, um, what do you do when they get off track? And, you know, that, that whole, what, what does the feedback and guidance look like? And then he, um, he's trying to make a point that, uh, we need to get away from having some set a curriculum agenda, but at the end of the day, you still have to have these question prompts. You have to have, you know, you, there's some mean, you know, there's some end that you're trying to get to uh, just by virtue of asking the question. You're trying to set them down on a certain path, and to me, those were the big questions that I, at least, I didn't hear answered. He had some very cute, clever ones where he's had the kids, and there were um, Jeff. To your point, I think you mentioned this came out of the English language piece of it. He was also using um, some pretty cool examples of where he had kids only learning in a second language, and then so they had to overcome the language barrier and then also tackle the subject matter at hand. And so, I, you know, I'm not sure if that even makes sense to someone who's familiar <laughs> with with teaching uh, language. If that's even, are they really learning the language, or are they just learning enough words that they're able to, um, to you know, muddle their way through the lesson? I'm not sure, but um, but anyway, back to this whole idea. There, there still is got to be some design to what you're doing. If you're putting out this prompt and you have someone sitting there on the side, they have to at least know what the right or wrong path is and try to help them get on the right path. There has to be something out there. And that, to me, that piece was not very, very well defined in what I've read. But Jeff, maybe you've maybe read a little bit more about that. Like, how would you actually set up one of these, for example? Well, I mean, the concern about the data analytics piece 
okay, that's a, a valid concern, but I got much more from him the value of uh, self-organized learning and inquiry-based learning where you, you toss out an interesting question, a problem that has to be solved, and you encourage learners to work together to solve that. Right, um, and, and that's my point, is that's not new. To me, that wasn't no. new, right? So that's where I was and, like, why is everyone so up in arms? <laughs> this like, this yeah. happens all the time, but uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm a lot less concerned about education being radically changed because of what Mitra is saying and, you know, oh my God, we're just going to take all the teachers out and just put a computer in the room, wah, 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 uh, than I am about things kind of staying the same and all the inefficiencies. And I, I think, again, he points out a lot of inefficiencies and I think the system really does have to radically change. Just like the professor who's teaching to reading his notes to 500 students, how in this city of 4 million people, how many high school physics teachers or elementary science teachers are teaching the exact same thing at the exact same time, getting paid multiple. If there's engaging content that students could learn on their own, uh, I think there's something of value. And I, I think that's what bothers teachers is sometimes he kind of makes a point of teachers get in the way and students would actually learn better if you just gave them some material and an interesting question and let them engage. And I think I think there's something to that. And Graham, I wanted to let you know I had muted you uh, as you were moving around, so feel free to chime in and unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I think that, yes, inefficiencies, not in all cases, are bad. I think some inefficiency is probably good in the system. Um, battling inefficiency is good. I agree. That doesn't change the whole cognitive tutor Bayesian knowledge, knowledge tracing challenge. Um, there's no question as to whether or not this is happening. It's happening already. The question becomes, what are we after from the education system? And so often this conversation comes back to the same question. So the, the way that sort of like edX is built is content, you do it discovery style, but what you discover is predefined and it's step by step. It looks cool, there's lots of discovery style stuff in it, but it's discover this, then discover this, then discover this, then discover this, and what you have is a very sort of linear conception of what knowledge is and what learning is, right? So if that's what we want education to be, then there's no problem with any of this, uh, because it's fine, because it'll do it, and it'll do it better. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt in my mind that it's going to be easier for my son to learn physics on a computer by himself if what it means to learn physics is to be able to conquer each of the learning challenges to get to the end and get a cookie. So can we use this as a way t for your son to learn physics uh, maybe more efficiently and then spend that other time interacting with his cohorts on applying what he's learned in physics to solving real problems? Or applying that's that the flipped to, classroom model, man. That I, I, I mean, sure. Yeah, and and if he was saying that, I'd be super happy with it. But that's not what he's saying. Well, what he's uh, saying is that our traditional inefficient model of educating students can be improved upon through automation because all we're doing are the bottom two layers of blooms anyway. Right. So yeah. why don't we do that? And that's, that was a thing we haven't gotten to yet. It was completely to your point, John, is um, there was, z to me anyway, zero application. This was all, I mean, it, it was beyond an application of answering a question. I mean, <laughs> they were able to, you know, answer the question. But could they, for example, they had some physics things. Like, like to your point, John, can they actually then do that? <laughs> can they go out and do in the real world that thing? I don't, I don't think there's much opportunity for them to practice that, try it, um, I did not see that in the model that he was talking about, but but that doesn't mean we can't embrace what he's talking about and then add other things to that. I mean, when I look at at Khan, for example, uh, my my kids can learn all of the math they need to know through Khan Academy. There there's no reason to sit in a classroom and have a teacher lecture on this is section seven point five where we learn to solve polynomials. It's in con, and the practice is there, and the assessment is there, and when they have mastered it, they can move on to the next topic, and it, they can do it completely at their own pace. The The advantage comes from the application piece, and if they're not getting that in a traditional classroom, then why are we wasting our time? All right. It's a half an hour.
Oh man, already. Uh, uh, although, I'm going to suggest a post show. An open. I'm going to toss the link into the chat room, and anyone who wants to join can join for a post show. How about that? That sounds good. How about that? Wow. Um. All right. Cool. Well, well any any closing words before we we cool. wrap up the non post show, the pre post show? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the show. No, I think this was a great. Uh, I like this format, by the way. So let's do more of this. We have a, a where, thing. Where there's actually at. a topic. There's and a topic. We can read We bring some in links. somebody in who knows something we about bring the topic. Someone in. Exactly. Yeah, that. Let's do that. Rather <laughs> <laughs> than going, hmm, I don't know anything about that article. I haven't read uh, it. Do we have a question for next week? Oh, that's the hard part of this, isn't it, then? <laughs> You've got to come up with that thing in the links. No, not yet. We've got to wait. We've got Twitter and Facebook and what else do you have going, Jeff? But Google Plus? Some week I would love to have the question, what's new? Uh, and like have a, just a good old-fashioned link dump. I saw Dave posting about Scratch. I hadn't really checked out Scratch before. and mm -hmm. you know, It's been like three years since we did a link dump. I hope you all have a couple of sites. <laughs> and yet we I'd have to, to probably dig to find 12 links. <laughs> We have to fire up the um, delicious account. Yeah, let's see what's in, let's see what Jen has tagged. In the last three years. Exactly. Um, no, I'm done. Okay, you can. We, are we done now? Uh, are we in post show? I guess so. No out point at all. Do an out. Do an out. But you like those little. Do it. I try all to right. make it a little Just closer. Just in case somebody <laughs> someday wants to edit this. Yeah. First, I want to check in with Graham if he has any final words. Um, no, no, I'm just um, I'm just trying to catch up with you all. You <laughs> I came in uh, <laughs> a bit late as well. I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, and I'll, before I welcome Vanessa to the conversation, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. Post your questions wherever using EduQuestion or on our different social media spaces, and we'll uh, look forward to continuing next week. <laughs>